I'm now pleased to introduce our speaker, Barbara Haskell, a distinguished and long-term curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Among the landmark thematic exhibitions she's curated and most of us have heard about at one point or another are the American Century Art and Culture 1900 to 1950 and BLAM, the Explosion of Pop, Minimalism and Performance 1958 and to 1964. She's curated exhibitions and written accompanying monographs for many artists, including Marsden Hartley, Edward Steichen, Georgia O'Keeffe, Donald Judd, Red Grooms, and notably, in 2013, she curated the major exhibition, Robert and Deanna, Beyond Love. I've known about Barbara's keen curatorial perspective since I encountered a catalog to an exhibition she organized in the early 70s for the Pasadena Art Museum called Klaus Oldenburg, Objects into Monuments. The exhibition and book drew heavily on Oldenburg's proposals for monuments in the form of drawings, models, and writings, including, which was how I learned about this exhibition, his early clothespin drawings from 1967. Now remember, Philadelphia's clothespin wasn't installed until 10 years later in 1976. Her current exhibition, Grant Wood, American Gothic and Other Fables, is on view at the Whitney through June 10th. Like Indiana, it occurred to me, Wood was an artist whose body of work was eclipsed by a single image that became an American icon. So please join me in welcoming Barbara Haskell as she introduces us to the vast and complex body of work of Robert Indiana Beyond Love. Barbara. So Love, the sculpture whose return to Philadelphia we celebrate tonight. Um, is, as you've heard and know, one of the most popular images in 20th century art. People know the sculpture, who don't know Robert Indiana's name, don't know his other work, and possibly don't even speak the English language. The image is seen, as you've seen in the, from the photograph of people declaring their love and asking for someone's hand in marriage, it's become a bold declarative affirmation of affection and brotherhood. Robert Indiana, however, is a very unlikely purveyor of such sentiments. He was born out of wedlock. He was adopted as an infant by Carmen and Earl Clark, a, a couple hit hard by the Depression. He grew up poor, as he said, on the other side of the tracks, in a world he described as bleak, cheap, and tawdry. He described moving 17 times before he was 21 and feeling that he never had a home. Indiana spoke of these adoptive parents as part of the lost generation, whose dream of upward social mobility turned out to be hollow. To distract themselves, as he described it, from, the meaning, from any meaningful aspects of their lives, they spent their time traveling from one grubby bar and roadside cafe to another, along with their adopted son. On these excursions, Indiana was introduced to a different kind of America, one that was optimistic and confident symbolized for him in the bold advertising signs that lined the interstate highways of his home state of Indiana. Indiana was good at art, and because it was something so removed from his parents, he saw it as an escape from this tawdry life. After high school and a very disastrous stint in the Air Force, he went to the Art Institute of Chicago, then studied at Skowhegan, and finally at the University of Edinburgh. Not surprisingly, given his background, the art he made during this period is informed by themes of redemption and sacrifice. You can see the, the piece on the left is the memorial to the soldiers who died in the Korean War, and in the right, um, a crucifixion. Other work that he did in this period, these very menacing Byzantine black heads. The piece on the, on the right, many, many tekel, is a reference to the, the biblical story, the handwriting on the walls of Balthazar's palace that Daniel interpreted to mean that the Babylonian king's kingdom was about to be destroyed. Um, what's important about these works is that he never abandoned their content. He's, he simply hid it within the bold, cheerful vocabulary of advertising. 
In September 1954, Robert, Indy, Robert Clark, as he was still then known, uh, moved to New York. And two years later, he met Ellsworth Kelly, whose picture you can see on the right with Indiana, um, who was already a successful artist. He'd just come back from Paris, had a very successful show at the Betty Parsons Gallery. He was five years Indiana's senior. The two became lovers and moved to Coney Slip, which was an area in downtown Manhattan that was separated from the rest of the city by the remnants of the elevated train. It was an area illegal to live in, so the rents were cheap. Um, and it attracted a, a like-minded group of artists who, like Kelly, were breaking from the tradition, the dominance of abstract expressionism, and pursuing a vocabulary hard-edged geometric style. Um, among the people in that group were Agnes Martin, Kelly, Dunk Youngerman, Robert, Robert um, Jack Youngerman, Jasper Johns, and Robert Rauschenberg. So it didn't take Indiana long before he started emulating the style of these co uh slip peers. Uh, his first foray into the style you can see on the right, it's an image of two ginkgo leaves, which was a tree that he could see outside his window, that to him metaphorically portrayed his relationship with Kelly, who he identified with the ginkgo leaf. The, the ginkgo tree is exclusively male or female, which means, as Indiana said, it, it was in, unable to have normal sex. So the, the uh, symbolism was particularly apt given the, the uh, relationship between these two individuals. But it was not until the large-scale painting on paper called Cru Crucifixion that Indiana really felt that he had, had reached an aesthetic breakthrough. Um, as, with the, the, as would be true of all of his subsequent work, the forms in the piece were symbolic. You see Christ in the middle as an avocado seed, um, surrounded on the right by the 12 apostles, represented by the circles, and on the left, the, the three circles representing the Trinity, and the two men on, who were condemned at the same time on the far right and the far left. It took Indiana a year to finish the piece. Um, when, he, when it was completed, um, he, he, he described hating the idea that something good would happen to Robert Clark, which was a name he associated with everything he disliked and wanted to escape from. So he changed his name. He felt that he'd had a rebirth in making this piece, and so it was appropriate that he took, take on a new identity, and he became Robert Indiana, uh, identifying himself with the, with the American heartland that he, was, that he had come from. His next series was a, were paintings of these uniformly um, spaced orbs, and like the avocado seed and the ginkgo in the, in the crucifixion, these seemingly objective forms for Robert and Dan also held symbolic content. He had been raised as a Christian scientist, and in that church, the idea of the circle was associated with divinity, man's eternal nature. So that in a piece like this, although it seems very much part of the geometric tradition of, of his Coenus Lip Piers. For Robert Indiana, it represented something far more metaphysical and meaningful. Another piece he made at the time, Adjadir, which was, you can see in a, in a journal that he made, it was objectively titled after a Moroccan town, which had um, been destroyed by an earthquake. You can see the up in the upper left, the, the newspaper article about the destruction of, of Adjadir. But as you can also barely make out probably by the writing, Indiana associated it with the breakup of a lover. So this dramatic um, earthquake he associated with the breakup was dramatic enough to be associated with the breakup of a lover. He likened this union of public and private content to what he called the binocular vision of, the, of birds. Birds have two eyes which see the same object in slightly different ways and create for them a sense of three-dimensional space. But the idea of two facets of the similar object appealed to Indiana. He had been reading a book called The Unquiet Grave by Cyril Connolly. Connolly had used that phrase, binocular vision, as well as the phrase two-faced truth to describe the synthesis of two disparate things into a single entity that simultaneously maintained the integrity of its distinct parts, something like Christ being both human and God. The process involved reconciling the either, either or into the holy both. By providing a model to express what Connolly called his inexorably divided self, 
vision binocular allowed Indiana to create art that was private and autobiographical and public and objective at the same time. His next, he applied this context next to a group of works, a group of constructions made out of discarded wooden beams and castaway objects that he found on the streets and in the lofts, lofts of the Coetis Slip neighborhoods which were being destroyed at the time. He equated their rescue with his shift in identity from Robert Clark to Robert Indiana. He described this rescue as transmuting, as he said, the lost into the found, junk into art, the neglected into the wanted, the unloved into the loved. Indiana, Indiana called these constructions herms after the stone and bronze markers in the ancient world that would describe, define particular territory. I mean, particularly like the phallic associations that they, that they have, as you can see in the piece on the left. Indiana's, Indi, the shape, um, the vertical shape and the, and the use of words, he also derived, it, it reflected his own life. As you can see, the building in the, in the middle was the building in which Indiana lived, lived uh, occupied in Coenus Slip. Indiana's herms were clearly anthropomorphic, and he often spoke of them as keeping him company during lonely times in absence of a family. In addition to these anthropomorphic qualities, the herms were called tombstones, and their material wood were called the crucifixion. Indiana had been introduced to the connection between wood and the, and the crucifixion when he helped proofread Edward West's book called The History of the Cross. That he could, he, Indiana spoke of wood as always speaking of the cross, an idea that lent his her, herbs a certain poignancy, again connecting them with, with death and resurrection. In 1961, Wood, Indiana began to see, receive his first public recognition by way of these herms. That year, the dealer Martha Jackson included several of them in an exhibition she mounted at her gallery called New Forms, New Media, that surveyed the work of a number of younger artists who were, who were working with discarded materials. The circles and stars words in Indiana's work contrasted with the work of other artists in the exhibition, Robert Rauschenberg on the left, Jim Dine in the middle. Who you, they were using found objects exclusively. The idea that, that Robert Danny was also applying words to the Herms really differentiated him completely with other, work, other artists in the show. Indiana considered words to be the subject matter of everyday life, he said. They were everywhere. They were more profuse than trees. He cited the French poet Apollinaire, who wrote that, that words are already soaked with humanity. So painting them on the herms gave Indiana a way to introduce the human without resorting to recognizable imagery or illustration. So he soon began to incorporate words in his paintings. At first, he selected very short words, female nicknames, and place names. The piece on the right, The American Sweetheart, is a series of, of short American female nicknames. The piece on the left is, it are, is it the names of the Coenda slip, Slips, the neighborhood that he lived in. In order to accommodate those words that were more than three, three letters, he had found, he found a circular stencil. And he began to use that stencil that would become a dominant part of his vocabulary. The message in those early paintings was fairly clear. They were either place names or female nicknames. As he developed the format, though, he began, he returned to the practice of, in, of embedding private experience into seemingly public art. Sweet Mystery on the left is the title of a well-known song from Naughty Marietta by Victor Hubert, Herbert, sorry, about love's pain and suffering. And to buttress that, that theme, you can see that Indiana included the black and red danger stripes at the top and bottom of his, of his painting. In the middle is the paired ginkgo leaf, which he associated with his relationship with Ellsworth Kelly, which was at that point, had been fraught and was at that point at an end. The work on the, on the right, The Triumph of Tira, he considered a companion piece to Sweet Mystery. And it also, to him, addressed the pain and volatility of intimacy and sexuality. The title itself refers to Mae West, her performance as Tira in a movie called I'm No Angel. But the but the paint the word the words law cat men and sex 
also referred to the perils of same-sex relationships at a time when sodomy was still considered illegal. Both paintings emulate the bold graphics of American advertising, and it was their American quality that was particularly important to Indiana. It was, in fact, the Americanness, he said, of Mae West that had drawn him to her. She was a, a homosexual icon in her own right, but she was also an extremely American character to him. He identified himself as an American painter at the time when American artists were trying to break free of Europe and establish an independent indigenous American art form. Indiana was in the lead. He, he said, I, I'm an American painter determined to paint the American scene in an American way. And this idea of painting an American way was what led him to combine these high, high key colors, hard edge shapes into a, a technique that he said, how American can it be? So this was, he adopted the bold advertising, bold graphics of advertising in a way that he felt com communicated something about the American experience and certainly something about the signs that he'd seen on these, these highway rides that his parents had taken him on to these, as he said, grubby bars and roadside entertainments. Um, Indiana's next painting, American Dream, broadened the, his, the range of his themes beyond intimacy to address what he felt was American shall, America's shallow materialism. The flat high key colors and staccato forms of this picture evoke the flashing lights, the raucous dim, dim, the neon glare of the pinball machines and roulette wheels in these bars and cafes that he'd been taken to as a child. But even though it suggests these roadside entertainments. Love remained the subtext of this painting. In his journal, he called it My Mexicali Rose, which was after a pop song about a man saying goodbye to his love. The words take all and tilt, he associated with the greed of gambling and the fraud of tilting the pinball machine in, in a way that allowed him to address what he felt was the country's avarice and materialism. Calling it the American dream was important. Indiana identified that phrase with the grandiose ambitions of his adopted father, whose dreams of uh, having a big house on the hill never materialized. His, Indiana's childhood experience had convinced him, as he said, that the American dream was broken. It no longer was in effect for a lot of us. It was not just the disappointments of his father or himself that he aimed to portray. He vowed to address quote, something that has to do with the anguish of everyone. What's amazing about the painting and what seemed so riveting was that it was both celebratory and critical at the same time. Its message was dark, but its visual punch was exhil exhilarating. It was, in a sense, a holy both, not, uh, not neither either or, either or, but a, a combination of two contradictory things. Um, it openly portrayed what Indiana called all the Wiener aspects of life while testifying to America as what he called the best of all possible worlds. Indiana would ultimately make nine American dream paintings, all of which celebrated American post-war culture while simultaneously exposing its dark underbelly. His willingness to confront this dark underbelly is particularly apparent in work that directly contempt, condemned racial injustice, white supremacy, and the costs associated with what he called the ominous rise of the American military and industrial complex. He was deeply engaged in politics as a citizen and took seriously the responsibilities of the artist to, to comment on the ethics of contemporary American life. He described himself as a painter of signs, including the signs of the times. He did this overtly in paintings that bore witness to the violence against African-Americans and civil rights workers in the South and paintings that showed shed light on the American, America's legacy of racial injustice in the North. The Rebecca on the left refers to a, a slave ship that loaded provisions near his, his loft in Clinton's Slip after depositing slaves in Cuba. Alabama on the right was one of four Confederacy paintings that he made whose stars mark specific cities in those states that had witnessed egregious racial violence. Indiana's vocabulary was cheerful in those paintings and in all his work and reassuring, but his subject matter always explored the fundamental issues facing humanity, 
love, death, sin, and forgiveness. He united these themes with his commitment to be American in a series of paintings of, from 1961 that drew on the words of canonical American poets, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Herman Melville, and Walt Whitman. The calumet on the left features lines drawn from the opening stanzas of, Long, of Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha, in which warriors are brought together, various warriors from the various American Indian tribes brought together and admonished to put aside their discord and find strength in union. India made it at the time that the Berlin Wall was being constructed and tensions were escalating between the West and the Soviet Union. So the painting, in a sense, in Indiana's mind was a plea for brotherhood and peace. Again, this combination of very public geometric forms with a, a message that was far more personal and autobiographical. Year of the Meteors on the, on the right takes its lines from the opening stanza, stanzas of Walt Whitman's poem that compressed the events of 1959, 1859 and 1860, comets and meteors, the hanging of John Brown and the election of Abraham Lincoln. Whitman's determination to sing of the wonder, as you can see, nor forget to sing of the wonder, to sing of the wonder of the country, even in the light of its shortcomings and darker aspects, fit Indiana's prescription to, to synthesize commemoration and criticism. Indiana allied himself with earlier American painters as well as writers. For his fifth American dream that you see on the screen, he turned to Charles Demon whose abstract portraits provided a precedent for his own work. In creating his portrait of William Carlos Williams on the right, Charles Demuth used the poet's figure five that described the lights, the street lamp, the blaring sirens of a red fire truck as it roared down the street to put out a fire. Indiana funneled Demuth's image through his own, at this point, signature vocabulary of a five-pointed star and asserted his allegiance with, with Indiana, I mean, with, with Demuth, by inscribing 1928 and 1963 on the picture, denoting the years that he and Demuth had completed their respective canvases. The painting's arrangement of five-pointed stars to form a Greek cross symbolized for him the, the head, arms, and feet of a person, as well as the division of the world into four elements. And you can see die, air, eat, and hug. By linking his own life and, and, and highly personal use of, of commercial culture with earlier with this earlier in, um, painting from, from the nation's modernity, Indiana affirmed his own place within the pantheon of American modernism. Indiana's American Dreams launched his career as a painter. In 1961, the first American Dream, which you saw before, was included in a two-person show at the David Anderson Gallery in New York. Nothing sold from the show, but when it closed, Alfred Barr, who was the director of the Museum of Modern Art, came to the gallery, saw the painting, and bought it for the museum's collection. It was an act that Indiana later said changed the entire course of his life. A year later, Sidney Janis opened a show called New Realist that marked the emergence of pop art as a phenomenon. Indiana was included in that show, and in 1963, the Demuth American Dream that you see on the screen was included in a show at the Museum of Modern Art called Americans 1963. Almost overnight, Indiana became one of the leading artists associated with pop art. One critic called him the best known pop artist, while another predicted that he, quote, may prove to be the pacemaker of the 1960s. Although Indiana was labeled a pop artist, his work differed from that of his pop art peers. Indiana's work looked like advertising, but it always was, always was brought. It was always invented imagery, as opposed to the work of, of pop artists like Lichtenstein and Warhol, who used pre-existing media images for their work. But despite these differences, Indiana rose the wave of pop art popularity. He at one point said in an interview, "I'm only sitting here because of pop art." In the spring of 1964, he was included in Life magazine in an article on sold out art and was one of 10 artists that Philip Johnson commissioned to create work to hang on the facade of the Theaterama at the 1964 World's Fair. This was marked the, the public arrival of pop art. Indiana's contribution, as you can see, was an illuminated electric sign with the word eat 
that came the closest to obliterating the line between art and advertising, so much so that people lined up in front of the building expecting that there was a restaurant that was being announced inside the building, which caused the fair staff to turn off the illuminated artwork, uh, rendering it emasculated, as Indiana called it. The, the piece on the, on the right is an electric eat, which um, I'm happy to say is, is uh, hanging in the Whitney cafeteria. So we're continuing the, the notion that eat really does uh, advertise an eating establishment. But even before the fair was over, Indiana began to focus on single emotionally charged words, in particular, eat and die. Having grown up a Christian scientist, he was fully cognizant of the church's view of words as sacred. In, in, the, in Genesis, God speaks creation into existence by the Gospel of John. The sanctity of words had become the centerpiece of Christianity. In the beginning was the word, the word was God. The first words, eat and die, had, particularly meaning, had particular meaning for Indiana. His adopted mother was obsessed with death. Uh, once when, they had a, when their house was right next to a cemetery, she refused to go outside without somebody else being with her. And on every Memorial Day, he described, she would take them from, from graveyard to graveyard, putting flowers on the, on the graves of all their relatives. E had also particular relevance for him. Uh, she worked in diners after the father abandoned the family. And the last word she spoke to him before she died was, have you had enough to eat? <laughs> Privately, he associated eat with love and eat die with the Last Supper, again aligning those words with death and resurrection human fallibility and forgiveness. The next word, small single word that he, that he featured was love, had even more resonance, of course, than eat, die. He first introduced it in a small 1961 painting, Four Star Love. The next um, iteration of the word was in Love is God from 1964, which began as a commission from Larry Aldrich, who was um, opening up a museum of his own collection in a Christian science building that was being renovated. And when Indiana walked through the building with, with Larry Aldrich, he noticed the, the, the legend, God is love, which was emblazoned on the wall of that church, as well as every Christian science church that Indiana had attended as a child. He transposed the phrase into love is God. But he said afterwards that the painting started him thinking about the subject of love. A month after Aldrich's museum opened, the free speech movement exploded at the University of California. Students who had been barred from protesting by the Chancellor Clark Kerr started carrying banners that read F-U-C-K, which was an acronym for freedom under Clark Kerr. <laughs> but the, obs the obscene humor appealed to Indiana, and he made a painting with, the, with those four letters, a stacked, stacked one on top of the other, with the, with the U inflected as, as to, to make the image more dynamic. Several months later, the Junior Council of the Museum of Modern Art commissioned him to design the museum's 1965 Christmas card. So he substituted the word love for fuck, but kept the earlier painting's format. He made four paintings of the word in different color combinations. The museum chose the most chromatic, ch chromatically intense, red letters against a blue and green background. The success of the Christmas card, it sold out immediately, caused Indiana to think more about the word love and the uncanny power of the format that he had developed. So he began a, a series of paintings of the word, completing eight in time for his 1966 show at the Stable Gallery. All eight versions were in red, blue, and green, some in quartered compositions and some as mirrored formats that evoked, as he said, love's narcissism. Almost as an afterthought, he agreed to have the image made in aluminum as a multiple, a very small version, uh, 12 inches by 12 inches. But Indiana's exhibition appeared right at the time the counterculture exploded and the admonition to make love, not war, was garnering media attention. And his work instantly became a talisman of the cultural revolution and the free love movement. It, it went viral, being reproduced in newspapers and magazines across the country and emblazoned on every kind of object from cupcakes to door, I mean, sorry, uh, cups to doormats to key, key rings. Um, 
The only comparable image, as you've seen earlier, is American Gothic, which, like love, became a media sensation overnight. In both cases, both with Wood and with Indiana, the, the public's association with the image dif differed wildly from that of the artist. Indiana's far family had never used the word love. They, they preferred hug. His adult relationships had made him very wary of the fragility and precariousness of love. Inevitably, the embers go out, he said. Love is a dangerous commodity, fraught with peril. In, word, in earlier works that I've shown you, Sweet Mystery, Naughty Marietta, The Triumph of, of Tira, he had alluded to the pain and loss associated with love, but, but with love, he made it very explicit. The tilting the O in love, he attempted to introduce a degree of skepticism into the concept and to critique the hollow sentimentality associated with the word. His desire was to metaphorically suggest that unrequited longing, desire, and disappointment were as much a part of the experience of love as unconditional affection. But these, effect, these associations with the word were ultimately to be drowned out by celebratory ones. Just as it happened with Grant Wood's American Gothic, love came to stand for everything from amorous ardor to brotherhood and peace. In the decades that followed the show of, in 1966, Indiana came to accept these readings. Aware that his critical assessment of American culture had made little impact on the politics of the nation, he focused on the positive aspects of love as an antidote to the plight of the individual in the modern world. To this end, he returned repeatedly to stack letters spelling love, making multiple paintings and prints of the image and overseeing fabrication of large-scale sculptural versions in different sizes and different colors for outdoor display. His motivation remained political. I'm stuck with an old-fashioned purpose, he said. I haven't made a painting without a message. But adorning plazas and public spaces around the world, including here in Philadelphia, Indiana's love sculptures ultimately lost their commentary on the disappointments and failures of the American dream. The public came to see them exclusively as affirmations of what he called an optimistic, generous, and naive America. It is perhaps only in art that a man whose own experiences with love were disappointing has created an image, embraced the world over as a talisman of friendship, love, and truth. Thank you. <laughs> Jeff Barber, thank you very much oh, for no sharing so much more information about love and the and all of us. Okay. Uh, the things That's that okay. you look at and where you show the beautiful. Um, I know for me personally, it was really a treat to be up at the Whitney Museum. I can't remember how long ago, and to see some of his work at the museum, including in the restaurant. Um, it's all around you. So thank you. Um, I invite all of you to join us out in the lobby for a reception. And um, if any of you parked at the Kennedy House, there are parking vouchers that you can pick up to um, give you a discount to leave. So thank you all. Oh, Patty Phillips. Thank you. Hi. Thank you all for being here tonight. We're so delighted to have you here at Moore. And what a great evening. Thank you, Barbara, for such a fantastic lecture. I just wanted to add, in, in addition to the uh, invitation to the reception, my colleague, the director of the galleries here at Moore, Gabrielle Susan C. Lavin, will be here. The galleries will be open. Please grab food and beverage and feel free to wander around our senior thesis exhibition. And Gabrielle and I will be here to help you find your way or answer questions or whatever. So have a nice evening.